It's hard being a woman, and harder still being a feminist. And no one knows this better, perhaps, than our distinguished speaker this afternoon, the very controversial, some say contradictory, Miss Naomi Wolf. Miss Wolf is, one, is what some might call a very troublesome woman. As an author, she has written commentaries and exposés on the exploitation and control of women by a relentless beauty industry and the impersonal autocratic processes in America's maternity wards, questioning, among other things, the predominance of cesarean births in the 1990s, both of which re can resonate with us here. As a feminist, Ms. Wolf's glamorous profile on the dust jacket of the beauty myth especially, has raised many an already arched brow, as has her argument for acknowledging the moral issues inherent in the killing of a fetus, even as she maintains her pro-abortion stand. Miss Wolf is a Yale alumni. In 2004, she attempted to engage her alma mater over a matter of sexual misconduct by a professor. Yale was unresponsive at the time. I hope that the university's recent iteration against campus sexual misconduct under pressure of its victims is some vindication for Ms. Wolf. Ms. Wolf has also been political advisor to two American presidential candidates. And now I have the pleasure in bringing on Ms. Naomi Wolf. Wow. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dana. Thank you. Thank you. It is amazing for me. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. I can't think of anything nicer than to be introduced to a whole new country as a troublesome woman. <laughs> I wear that proudly. I hope it's the right kind of trouble. And, um, and it's really a dream come true for me to be in Singapore, which is somewhere I've always wanted to be and the conversations that I'm having here uh, and the kind of eye-opening experience of encountering this fascinating and complex and magical place um, is, it, 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 it's really extraordinary and I hope it's the, the beginning of many conversations in the future. Um, so what I'm gonna do today is talk about the beauty myth, but then I'm gonna use that to pivot to kind of a, an overview of issues in feminism and global feminism because I think we all care a lot about the beauty myth but there are you know we're in the middle of a gigantic revolution and it's a revolution that in some ways you know you hear uh, and and you know people in regions throughout the world are really at the forefront of um, so that's the arc I'm gonna be taking today and I want to just um, st can you all hear me in this beautiful space I want to start by telling a little joke about revolutions. Um, and the reason I keep using that word, revolution, is that women are rarely told by the media or by society in general that they're actually getting it all completely right. Um, they're, and they're almost never told that they're winning. Uh, and actually, the women's movement and the fights that women throughout the world have led for the last 30 years in particular um, have won what I would call, as I hope a very careful student of history, the biggest and most important set of victories our human species has ever manifested on the planet. Round of applause. So I just want to start out by saying you're doing it right. We're doing it right. It's working. The world that we're giving our daughters is, uh, you know, eons different from the world that our grandmothers came of age in, wherever they were on the planet. Um, and, and it's not because, you know, patriarchy just handed it to us. It's because brave, 
courageous women, some of them I recognize here as pioneers of the women's movement here in Singapore, uh, you know, fought and struggled and strategized and didn't give up and had faith that this world could someday come to be. So I just want to tell you that. It's not that we're not facing issues of all kinds. It's just that we're doing, you know, heroically. So I just want to start out by saying hooray for us. Um, now, and it is truly a revolution. And the revolution is not over. In some ways, it's just begun. Now, here's a little joke about revolutions. Once upon a time, there was a revolution. And <clears throat> as often happened in revolutions, three of the revolutionaries were caught and charged with treason and taken to be beheaded. These were two men and a woman. The first revolutionary was taken to the guillotine, and the headsman asked uh, him, how do you want to die, facing up or facing down? And he thought for a moment, and he said, I'll face down. So the headsman pulled the string, and nothing happened. The crowd went crazy. They said, it's a miracle. God has intervened. Set this guy free. So they set him free. The second revolutionary was taken to the guillotine, and he was asked, how do you want to die? And he thought, and he said, I'll face down. So the headsman pulled the string, and nothing happened. The crowd went crazy. It's a miracle. God has intervened. Set this guy free. They set him free. The third revolutionary was taken to the guillotine, and she was asked, how do you want to die, facing up or facing down? And she thought for a moment. She said, I'll face up. So the headsman pulled the string, and nothing happened. And she said, I think I see what the problem is. <laughs> so <laughs> this, of course, is a joke about how even the best of revolutions can go astray when we begin to internalize the attitudes that we're fighting. And very much what I'm going to call the beauty myth is uh, the enemy is our own internalization of ideas about ourselves that people who don't want have our best interests at heart want us to become preoccupied with. So let's do a little uh, kind of test or quiz. Um, the ideal, the ideal beauty, the ideal perfect woman physically that you see everywhere, and I went shopping in the mall in my hotel, and it's exactly the same ad campaigns, exactly the same models as back home and all over the world. Um, the, the images you see of the perfect woman from every magazine, every billboard, what does she look like? Is she tall or short, for instance? Tall. Is she um, very slender or heavy set or curvaceous? Is she thin? Okay, that's, there's a no-brainer for you. Um, and is she old or young? All right. Now, this is interesting. I wonder if it's any different here than most other places in the world I've been. Is she likely to be Caucasian and even blonde? Very interesting. Uh, okay, so she's young, she's thin, she's tall, she's probably Caucasian, even blonde. Let's call her Barbie. <laughs> now, where does Barbie come from? And by the way, you know, no one looks like that. No one looks like that in Sweden, you know? <laughs> like, no one looks like it anywhere in the world. We, we know this. So where does Barbie come from, that perfect ideal? You know, we're told or we're kind of given vague general notions that this ideal of beauty must come from nature. Surely that Darwinian thing, you know, the evolution of the species to maximize DNA reproduction. Well, okay, um, we'll look at that in a minute. Or we're told, well, it must have to do with sexual attraction, that this is some image that men, you know, for the majority of people who are heterosexual, that men, you know, are, uh, would naturally select. Or we're told uh, this is some platonic, transcendental ideal that exists in sort of some Socratic realm of forms somewhere. It's just descended from God or, you know, angels or something. You know, it's a very medieval <laughs> idea of like this transcendental truth. Uh, Barbie lives in heaven. Um, uh, and, and so that must be it. So let's just look at each of those for a minute. Each of them is complete nonsense um, if you look at history and the world. Because uh, first of all, it isn't nature because if you look at different times and places, 
throughout history, chronologically and geographically all over the world, there have been many, many, many different ideals of beauty. Um, in West Africa, for instance, until very recently, uh, heavier women were considered more beautiful. And uh, in fact, women were sort of burdened by being fattened up uh, and thinner women didn't have as much of a chance on the marriage market. In some parts of West Africa, actually, it's males who engage in beauty pageants and females who sort of sit back and sexually select. So that's a cultural reversal. Um, in, you know, in the 16th century, you know, Rubens, you know, my favorite period, the 16th and 17th century, these sort of luscious women who were just like eating donuts all day long, you know, <laughs> and they were like the superstars of their era. And if you go back just 30 or 40 years, uh, Marilyn Monroe, you know, there were times even in the 20th century when the ideal was much, much more curvaceous. She would be considered a plus size model um, by our, our contemporary standards. So. It's not nature. Is it sexual attraction? That's a really interesting question. Actually, it's not sexual attraction because, first of all, men and women fall in love with women who look all kinds of different ways and want to sleep with women who look all kinds of different ways. But also, if you just look at the neuroscience of um, reproduction, the women who are as thin as fashion models are are likely, and we'll get to this a little later, um, they're likely to be significantly underweight. And what is the number one thing that happens when you're significantly underweight? Your periods stop, exactly right. So you're not reproducing optimally. And in fact, I love this data point. Uh, the neuro hormones that boost libido and support reproduction, one of the important places that regulates those is the subcutaneous fat layer. So it, when you leave here, you know what to do. Just those donuts, that's just going to enhance your allure. Um, <laughs> and, and in fact, studies show that if you give men, a r and I'm not trying to be heterocentrist, it's just they haven't done the studies on lesbians, as is so often the case, but uh, if you give men, heterosexual men, a range of sizes to choose as most attractive, they choose sizes that are two sizes bigger than what we are tormenting ourselves of as seeking the ideal, the fashion model ideal. Um, and by the way, there's an, an infertility epidemic in North America and Western Europe, and a lot of specialists think it's because women are seeking this underweight ideal. They're, it's affecting their fertility. Uh, and is it, is it transcendental truth? Um, well, you know, no. <laughs> because of the way that we'll see um, politics has a role in the shape of the ideal. So w where did this ideal come from? What I'm gonna tell you today is that it, it actually came from the need to hold women back politically. Um, and that in fact, if you study women's history, you see this amazing thing, which is that when women take a giant leap forward, ideals arise in a backlash, okay? And this happens again and again. Um, I'm studying the 19th century, I'm the oldest graduate student in the world. Um, finishing a doctorate I began in 1984. <laughs> and um, I did other things in between, but you know, I'm, I am wrapping up, which my grandmother in heaven, wherever she is, is very happy about. Um, but in the 19th century, it was this huge push. You know, feminism was invented in the formal sense, uh, the suffrage movement, and the ideal became tinier and more and more passive and more and more fragile, um, you know, almost in a counterweight. And then women got the vote in 1920, and when was the first year that the flapper ideal uh, appeared on the scene? Suddenly women had no hips, they had no breasts, they, and dieting became a thing for the first time in, guess what year? 1920, exactly right. Um, then you had, uh, World War II, and then women went, were needed to go back to the home. And so you had this curvaceous ideal in the 50s, but another image uh, arose, which was the perfect housewife ideal, which Betty Friedan wrote about. So suddenly, at a time when at least North American culture needed women to get out of the workplace and go home to give the jobs back to the men returning from World War II, suddenly you were supposed to be obsessed with how shiny your floors were. 
right? And this image everywhere of the perfect, smiling homemaker who was supposed to get complete emotional fulfillment from polishing uh, became you know, this huge cultural thing. We don't even care about how our floors look anymore, right? But Betty Friedan had to write a whole book about it because it was such a giant pervasive ideal. Um, then another key moment, you watch, you almost see the female body kind of, you know, shifting depending on what's going on in the culture and politics. 1965, something happened. If, does anyone want to guess? Which really affected women's autonomy and ability to control their destiny. The pill, you got it. Um, and what else happened? Who else appeared on the scene as the most famous fashion model? Twiggy, exactly right. I love how completely global these references are. We're just like, we all know about Twiggy. <laughs> um, so, and, and Twiggy was, of course, she looked like she had, I mean, she's very beautiful, but she had one foot in the grave kind of thing, give her breakfast, you know? <laughs> and these things, I think, are not accidental, that at a moment when women finally have the chance to stop worrying about reproduction, stop worrying about whether, whether they're pregnant that month, stop worrying about not having control over their choices going forward, suddenly an ideal was introduced that made sure that they would keep worrying about something trivial and inconsequential rather than moving forward with their lives. So let's just look at that first aspect of Twiggy. I'm sorry, of Barbie, these E names of these, these sort of like Bambi, you know? <laughs> um, Let's just look at the thinness of the ideal. Something weird happened even with fashion models in the last 30 or 40 years. 40 years ago, the average fashion model weighed 10% less than the average woman. Do you want to guess how much less the average fashion model weighs now than the average woman? Oh, God, I heard over here. Oh, God. <laughs> 25, keep going. 30, keep going. It's 33%. And it's not like the average woman has inflated by 33% in that time. Um, the, the, proportionally, the size of the fashion model has dropped. So what do most women have to do to approach losing 33% of their body weight? Duh. I'm sorry, I shouldn't say duh. I'm supposed to be a global intellectual. <laughs> um, what, what diet, someone said, right? OK. So when I was 13, right before I got uh, an eating disorder, it was triggered by um, reading, well, actually, I'll tell you the whole story. Bobby Salen, um, whom audiences all over the world know his name by now, and that's maybe mean, I should probably use a pseudonym, but uh, <laughs> he was a kid in my, in my uh, Hebrew school who sort of, said to me, um, like, something like, getting chubby, wolf. And, uh, and of course, I reacted the way any 12-year-old would. I went on a diet, and I figured out how to do that by reading my mother's Cosmo magazines. And at that time, diets were about 1,200 calories a day. And so I went on a 1,200-calorie-a-day diet, and I followed it carefully. Within two weeks, I had lost... Um, you know, a lot of weight. I was a normal-sized child, by the way, but I wasn't fashion model thin. And then within two months, I had full-blown anorexia, which lasted for a year. And at my sickest, I weighed 83 pounds. I was five foot four. And my doctor said he could feel my spine through my stomach. And I, I tell you this because he also said that I had to eat or I would die. I had to gain weight or I would die. And he was really ahead of his time uh, even knowing about this because at that time people really were not familiar with these illnesses in the way that they are now. Um, I guess what I want to share is that during that year, my brain changed even more than my body because I couldn't, I was a smart, bright, you know, argumentative kid. <laughs> And, <laughs> and, and that year, I literally could not think about anything but food. And all the normal developmental things that teenage girls are supposed to be thinking about, like 
you know, opposing their parents or um, boys or, you know, dreams, they all shut down. And my, my brain was completely colonized by thinking about food. And what I want to share with you is that when I forced myself to eat and gain weight, which is one of the most difficult things a woman can do in this culture, um, w within a month, my brain had cleared, my obsessions had cleared, and I began to think normally and process information normally. So when I started to look at anorexia years later when I was writing The Beauty Myth, uh, I knew that the narrative about anorexia that cast it as a neurosis was wrong. And in fact, when I studied the physiology of starvation, everything became clear to me what had happened to me. Because when you go on a 1,200 calorie a day diet, your, your body operates at a level of semi-starvation. In fact, after World War II, the international uh, refugee organizations airlifted food to starving Dutch women because they were subsisting at that level of calorie intake. And what's striking is how chic these almost starving Dutch women look by modern standards in photographs. But when you're um, subsisting at that level, you, the brain actually creates an addictive response to starving. And then, so in other words, it's lowered calorie intake that for many women who get eating disorders cause the eating disorder, cause the obsession, cause the preoccupation. By the same token, you can clear a lot of these eating disorders when your culture insists that you have to treat yourself well and be healthy and you know, knock it off, you know, because it's not good for you. Um, and this is a big insight because uh, is, you know, every woman in my, in my college had some sort of body obsession, anorexia, bulimia, and I knew that these women were not all neurotic, crazy people, and I knew that they didn't come from neurotic, crazy families, and I knew from what had happened to me that there must be a causative link for many women, not everyone, between artificially low calorie intake and obsession, preoccupation. So why would the ideal cause this kind of preoccupation to pursue. I will tell you that my theory, and I'm sure I'm right, <laughs> is that it, the ideal became so thin right when your generation and the generation right before you of young women who should be the bravest, freest, most dynamic, most difficult, most challenging, most demanding, most transformational generation of young women ever to walk the planet, the ideal became so thin right now so that you would not be causing the trouble that you would otherwise cause. Was that a big round of applause in Singapore terms, right? <laughs> um, and, uh, and so that's the politics of, of the way this idea looks. Let's just look very quickly at two other um, aspects of Barbie, her youth. Uh, so why is she young? Why is she young? Why is she so young? And again, you know, people fall in love with people of all kinds of ages and stay in love with them. Uh, I will tell you that my research into anti-aging creams was pretty hilarious because it turns out that um, nothing penetrates the dermis. So, so it means that all of these, you know, you go into a department store and it's like $125 for, you know, La Mer, you know, placenta of a zebra thing. <laughs> you know, all, all of this stuff that's supposed to transform you and work miracles actually doesn't do anything at all. In the United States, you need a prescription to get anything that does anything at all because the FDA knows that these things you buy over the counter don't do anything. They don't get anywhere. They don't, they, they, they just can't. Like, th you read these, what magazines can say, I don't know what the laws are in Singapore, but before the beauty myth came out, there were still laws in North America and Western Europe where these ads were saying cellular transformation. Like cellular transformation is like cancer, you know? <laughs> like, I mean, you just don't, it doesn't transform the cell. So, uh, but they could say anything. And women were spending, you know, multi-billion dollar industry. 
um, I'm sorry, multi-million dollar industry, um, or, and and probably, you know, in the powers of multiples around the world. Uh, so apart from the profit motive, and by the way, the dieting industry is the $300 million dieting industry in the United States alone, but apart from the profit motive, why would the ideal be so thin? I'm sorry, so uh, young. So young that when you read a magazine, what you're not told is that literally lines are airbrushed out of women's faces, even if they don't want lines airbrushed out of their faces. So you're basically reading censored material all the time when you just look at an article about a woman in the news who could be in her 30s or 40s or 50s or 60s. Um, the magazine will airbrush the lines. Why is that? Because the major revenue in a glossy magazine is the advertisers. And the advertisers don't want you ever to see a women held up for public admiration in the mass media who are not extremely thin because of that industry and who, are, who don't look artificially young because of the anti-age cream industry. Because the anti-aging cream industry, because it doesn't actually sell you anything, depends on your looking in the mirror and thinking, God, this woman's 50 in Vogue magazine, and she looks 30 years younger than I do. You know, there must be something really wrong with the way I'm aging. I better buy the placenta thing, over, you know, immediately. Um, so there's this active censorship going on in the mass media. I actually am friends with someone who used to produce uh, be one of Oprah's producers, and she said that there were any number of fascinating women uh, that they just couldn't have on the show because the advertisers wouldn't let them have women of various shapes and sizes uh, or various ages as guests on the show. They had to follow a very narrow uh, kind of window of what a woman looked like. And women in, um, in television generally say that that's true as well, that you can have incredibly dynamic women, but the advertisers won't let you showcase them um, if they vary from a very narrow model. And uh, you know, I see from just watching TV at the gym here in Singapore that your TV presenters are you know, tr trapped in the very same double standard that our TV presenters are trapped in. And the last thing I want to talk about super briefly in terms of the ideal is her cosmetically enhanced status, I mean uh, surgically enhanced status. So um, the Barbie, our ideal fashion model friend, she's tall, she's thin, she's young. What else is anomalous about her? What size are her breasts? They're huge, right? She's super thin and she has really big breasts. How often does nature make women who look like this, right? And not only are her breasts really big, but they defy gravity. Right? They're just floating in the air, like blimps, you know, like just floating. Like there is no, um, there is no physics where Barbie lives. <laughs> so so she, why is that? Because she's, she's surgically augmented. Now, I wrote a whole chapter on the dangers of cosmetic surgery in the beauty myth, and I was a 26-year-old English major. In other words, I didn't have any medical training whatsoever. But what I did do was just look at a couple of uh, trade magazines, magazines aimed at plastic surgeons. And what I saw there shocked me because there were many, many advertisements for breast implants, which you'd expect, they're plastic surgeons, but these advertisements sold the breast implants in the multiples as a set because they knew that there would be a 30 to 70 percent rupture rate and they'd have to be repeatedly inserted, repeatedly inserted. And not only that, they sold the doctor's insurance to cover the fact that they knew that there was this 30 to 70 percent rupture rate. But when you read articles in women's magazines, it didn't say oh, breast implants, be prepared for a 30 to 70 percent rupture rate and repeat uh, surgeries. Um, so I saw that there was this disconnect between what the doctors knew and what the marketplace of women being targeted knew. Now once again, why do women's breasts look like that in fashion magazines and in 
billboards and so on, but especially magazines, partly because if you look in the back of the magazine, a major advertiser are these doctors selling uh, cosmetic surgery, and breast enhancement is a huge industry. By the way, plastic surgery varies in its popularity region by region around the world. I've been told that here, in this part of the world, um, nose surgery is a very popular thing, but that breast implants are popular as well, just not talked about. Um, so, so even though I knew nothing about medicine, I knew that, you know, I was able to report on these complications that turned out later to be, you know, confirmed and the subject of big congressional hearings and FDA changes in how uh, breast implants are marketed. Um, but, you know, pr plastic surgery has become more and more uh, accepted and more and more normative. S and new technologies like Botox mean that we really almost never see in the mass media um, older women looking older or unsurgically reconstructed women looking unsurgically reconstructed, which kind of changes our idea of what's normal. And the last thing I want to say about that is that since I wrote The Beauty Myth, I think that the, uh, what I call the official breast, you know, Barbie's breast, the, the only permissible breast to see, even though women's real breasts vary so much, um, that's kind of entered women's consciousness, especially young women's consciousness, more and more because of the impact of pornography. And so if young women grow up, I mean, everyone who grows up today really grows up learning about sex from pornography. And I'm not making a moral judgment about this, just it, ch it changes in a very intimate way how free women feel about differing from that ideal. Because if they feel like that, they have to look like that to be sexually well treated or to feel good about themselves sexually, that's a much deeper way of internalizing these ideals than before pornography became so much a part of our lives. Um, so now that I've shared like the deconstruction of Barbie, I just want to say that it's not a magic bullet or a magic wand. Like now that you know how she's constructed, it doesn't mean you'll never think about this ideal again. But I have found that knowing how artificially she's constructed, and by the way, when I wrote The Beauty Myth, it was airbrushing that made her look like that, and now it's digital. Like when you look at these ads, you're not seeing a real human being anymore. Literally, they take the picture and then they stretch out the legs or they elongate the neck or they do all kinds of stuff that has nothing to do with how that original woman even looks. But now that you know about how she's put together, it, it may free up some space. Or this is what I found, is that people take this information and then you know, go through a process of critiquing what they see around them. And what I'm excited to say is that all over the world, um, new generations of women are having new conversations about what I've called the beauty myth and creating new solutions for seeing beauty in all kinds of other ways, reclaiming the definition of beauty and reclaiming it as a, and I think this is a political thing, for women to be able to say, I am beautiful. You know, it's a very transgressive sentence um, without handing over the validation to something outside of themselves. Now I want to talk for a few minutes about feminism is in general. Is that okay? that we've deconstructed Barbie, now we can kind of move on because we've got all this energy and you know, freedom to think. Um, so Barbie is just a symbol, and in every culture, she's kind of a Rorschach for ways in which women are suppressed. Um, but now I'm going to go on to kind of ways in which women are fighting back and talk about a, a crisis and an opportunity in feminism, in the bigger picture. <clears throat> so I said when we started out, this, this quiet is Singapore listening, right? Okay. <laughs> I, like, I come from such a rude city that it's hard to get used to courtesy. <laughs> it's like, what are these people doing? Oh, they're being polite. Okay. <laughs> okay. It's like, um, yeah, it's really relaxing. <laughs> but, um, uh, so when, when I said we're you know, in the middle of a revolution, I mean it globally, um, that women around the world are, uh, you know, changing m more and more quickly than ever in history. And in many ways, the, the locus of the revolution is in the developing world rather than in the West. And that's what I want to talk about a little bit. I, I want to talk about a 
it is hard to say because I'm sort of critiquing my own tribe, but I've started to say it in public and I think it's important. I feel like what's happening now globally, and I'm really taking you know, a big step back to talk about a very big picture, is that <clears throat> Western feminism, which had a lot to say that was very, very valuable for 30 or to 40 years, has really kind of come to an intellectual standstill and that the real invigorating, exciting, and intellectually coherent versions of feminism are being articulated in the developing world and that it's time for kind of the, the attention of the world to kind of shift around feminism so that we're learning from the feminisms emerging in the developing world and that could hopefully heal some of the problems we're having with feminism in the West. Can I go ahead and talk about that? All right. So a super quick analysis of what went wrong with feminism in the West, and bear with me, I'm gonna paint with a very broad brush. And so of course there are exceptions to everything I'm saying, but this is my summary. So feminism started out with Mary Wollstonecraft in sort of its purest, I would say, iteration at the end of the 18th century. And those of you who are not familiar with Vindication of the Rights of Woman, go out and read it. It's the core text, in my opinion. And she basically articulated a feminism that was completely in line with the Enlightenment. So what is, what's so great about the Enlightenment? The Enlightenment is awesome. With every day that goes by, as the world descends into barbarism, I, I, I like the Enlightenment more and more. The Enlightenment was a time when people like Mary Wollstonecraft um, and all of her sort of male peers and colleagues were talking about the rights of men and the rights of women, as she chimed in, uh, talking about um, equal dignity for all, um, basic freedoms, freedom of expression, freedom of religion. Obviously, the United States and what we used to call American values emerged out of the Enlightenment. I mean, I say that you know, with regret because I'm missing those values at home, but that's another book. Um, so what she said is women need to evolve to be free exactly the way that everybody else needs to evolve to be free, right? It was an enlightenment argument about basic human rights. So who's gonna argue with that? No one can say she's wrong. Anywhere you go in the world, this is a, like a no-brainer kind of position, right? However, Feminism detoured away from Mary Wollstonecraft's vision in America and Western Europe after World War II. What happened? A, a couple of accidents of intellectual history. <clears throat> after World War II, Simone de Beauvoir, the French intellectual, wrote a very uh, influential book called The Second Sex. Well, Simone de Beauvoir was an existentialist. So what does this mean? This is, I mean, no disrespect to the existentialist. It was a weird little intellectual detour. Right? Because existentialists fetishize the individual at the expense of the community, and they fetishize individual choice, and they're kind of nihilistic. They don't believe there's really anything else out there. So they're a kind of a cool subculture, cool, you know, fashion, cool sitting in cafes, and it was, you know, necessary in the 50s. <laughs> but they did their thing. The trouble is that Simone de Beauvoir being an existentialist meant that the first important rearticulation of feminism in the West fetishized the individual at the expense of family, connection, relationship, uh, bigger picture, fetishized choice over everything, and was highly secular. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with any of those things, I'm just saying that's not necessarily what feminism has to be. Then that set of values got re sort of popularized by Betty Friedan in North America. And then the feminism that followed in North America, which has been a very influential version of feminism in Western Europe and you know, recently around the world, led into some real cul-de-sacs intellectually because femi this feminism, I mean, they did great things. Don't get me wrong. Title IX, Title VII, equal opportunity, fantastic. I really appreciate everything they did in the 70s, especially a high point. However, North American feminism sort of took as essential that it was a gender war between men and women, which is 
a terrible way of phrasing what we're talking about. Catastrophic. It's not a gender war. It's a war for e equal rights and human dignity. Right? You get the distinction? All right. They made some other mistakes, like from time to time, some feminist writers like Andrea Dworkin and Catherine McKinnon would locate the enemy in men and masculinity rather than in oppression and sadism and barbarism and inequality and so on. Thus, you know, reinforcing this kind of existential alienation between the sexes and making men feel like they had no role in feminism. And they also began to uh, describe feminism not as this beautiful enlightenment ideal of equal dignity and opportunity for all, but as a set of lifestyle choices, right? Like, what are you wearing? There are more and less feminist ways to dress. I often wear really slutty shoes just as a reaction against the kind of puritanical dictates of feminism that I grew up in with. Um, <laughs> I'm not wearing my sluttiest shoes today, but <laughs> I have them, trust me. Uh, you know, it became like a judgmental about sexuality. Who are you sleeping with, right? There are right and wrong people to sleep with and right and wrong ways to do it. It became sort of a truism that you had to be secular versus religious or traditional, uh, thus ruling out, you know, the millions of women who care strongly about women's equality, but who have deep religious faith of whatever kind. Very negatively for all, of, uh, you know, for us, for the human species, it kind of was co-opted by advanced capitalism, and I think the advertising culture, to create this ideal of choice over everything and uh, corporate productivity over everything. Uh, which sort of meant that feminism tended to be seen as valorizing women's status as corporate workers rather at the expense of their roles as mothers or householders or people who are nurturing a family or partners. And, um, and, it, and it always fetishized choice, an individual choice, which is a great thing over any larger connection to the community or to a spiritual life. Uh, and so what this did was it kind of led to a feminism which I find extremely tedious in North America and point, pointless, not the main point, in which again and again there's some stupid panel I have to be on about like mothers who work versus mothers who stay home or, you know, what does it mean that Taylor Swift said this or that, you know, from a feminist perspective. And <laughs> like this is what it has deteriorated to. Okay, so these are, these are intellectual cul-de-sacs. They're not coherent, they're not interesting, and they're not where the revolu revolution needs to go. And they're a departure from that beautiful uh, ideal of the Enlightenment. So now you go to India, or you go to Brazil, or you go all over the Muslim world, all over the Middle East, and you hear a very different articulation of feminism. Well, many articulations, but those are much more in alignment with that ideal from the Enlightenment. Because the Enlightenment belongs to everyone, it's not a Western thing, and all over the developing world, grassroots leaders and activists are claiming and interpreting for their own circumstances what the Enlightenment would look like. What would it look like if everyone had equal rights? What would it look like if everyone had freedom of expression? What would it look like if everyone had freedom of religion? And if everyone was free to develop his or her capacities to the fullest in a humanistic way, right? That's feminism. That's the feminism I truly believe in. So that, you know, where I'm hearing that more is is articulated by women in the developing world because they haven't had to go through this detour of the lifestyle thing, the secular thing, the commodified thing, the corporate thing. So, so it's much more in alignment with the great tradition. I want to say too that you see solutions in the developing world that you're not seeing in North America as a result of this. When I was in India, for instance, I never heard an articulation of feminism that pitted women against the family. And I think that's very healing because of all the jobs I do, the one I'm most proud of is being the mother of two beautiful children. It's much harder than writing eight best-selling books, trust me, and takes a lot more thought and care. Um, I'm not saying I'm not proud of my other work. I would not want to, be, to not have a choice, but I'm saying a feminism that dials down my sense of the importance of being a good mom 
or of the role of love and nurturing and caring, let alone spirituality and other non-transactional things, uh, doesn't speak to the whole of my life and what I care about. And so I felt much more realized as a woman talking to feminists in the developing world rather than in North America. Um, and I don't have time here to go into the incredibly exciting ways that I've seen women in various parts of the world, but most, most notably, you know, Africa, Asia, and the Middle East, <laughs> basically, sort of everywhere else, uh, you know, put these theories into practice. Um, but I, I think that the ways in which they're doing that is a tremendous corrective. So um, do I have time for a brief detour into one other issue? No, yes, no, I do. All right, well, I want to say super fast that just as there's leadership in every part of the developing world that I've been to that's fresh and new, there are also unique challenges in every part of the developing world. A couple of things I've heard in my very brief time here, and on Facebook, I keep saying, what is Asian feminism? Because in interviews, people keep saying, speak about Asian feminism. And of course, I don't know what I need to know about Asian feminism, so you'll enlighten me. But the themes I'm hearing here are many of the same themes about concern over the glass ceiling, concern about you know, being kept in certain roles down in corporate terms. Um, an interesting uh, cultural issue, and every region has their own cultural issue, but in a culture that values uh, courtesy and sees self-aggrandizement as rude, how do women advocate for themselves? That's a really interesting question. It came up a lot at the Leadership Institute I co-founded, where you had women from different parts of the world, and in the more polite cultures, women had greater, I don't want to say difficulty, but it was not comfortable to be as pushy and obnoxious as, you know, people from my culture are more comfortable being. Um, so that's an important conversation to have. Um, and the other fascinating thing I heard about Singapore specifically, and we can get into this in the Q&A, is that, oh, this is tricky. But, you know, crime and punishment, I'm sure there are a million things we could say about crime and punishment in Singapore, but one of the interesting things I heard is that rape and sexual assault are actually penalized here in such a way that women feel quite safe from sexual assault. I don't know if you're confirming or denying this, reasonably safe, it's true. And that is a completely unique situation you know, in, in all the countries I've been to around the world, I've never heard of a culture that puts rapists' faces in the newspaper. It's totally unique. And I'm just really, you know, I'm sure there are many pluses and minuses. Every country has pluses and minuses. But that is really a remarkable thing. I want to move on quickly to Islamophobia, and then I will have covered what I want to cover with this talk. Do we have two minutes for Islamophobia? All right, thank you. I know this is a multicultural country, and I know it's not a Muslim country per se, but it has a strong Muslim influence. Um, a huge challenge to hearing the voices that we need to hear globally is the way certain geopolitical entities, mostly based in my home country, are trying to whip up Islamophobia and using feminism as one of the ways to do it. And what I mean is, spokespeople in the West that are highly funded, belonging to think tanks that are highly funded, whose clients are basically the military industrial complex, which is a big sector of our economy, have made a strategic choice to demonize all of Islam all over the Muslim world and often to use feminist tropes and appeals to do so which I think is extremely cynical and horrible. Um, and so you'll get uh, this whole industry of paid commentators in North America, but they have influence globally because the media is increasingly global, who will always amplify some awful thing done to women in a Muslim country and assign it to Islam rather than to that you know, practice or that local culture um, and kind of not ever shine a light on the ways in which many Muslim feminists around the world are using the Holy Quran and reinterpreting, you know, uh, you know, squarely within the traditions of Islam to advance and advocate for women. 
um, and doing it very successfully. I mean, there's, I took, you know, Islam 101 in college, and I think I was taught by a very enlightened guy because he showcased the ways in which the Holy Quran was a feminist document. And so to me, you know, and traveling all over the Muslim world and meeting these incredible Muslim feminists, there's no question that, you know, you can be deeply religious in that tradition as in any and advocate effectively from within the religion for women. Um, and that this is, you know, a huge thing that's happening in the world and a very, very important one. But because of this whipped up for-profit Islamophobia, we never hear about it. And in the West, there's this artificial divide being, and it reminds me a lot of anti-Semitism in the 30s, frankly, uh, being um, kind of fostered and fomented to, to kind of fetishize women's issues in Islam as a way to create distance between peoples rather than drawing people together. And one tiny example of this is the hijab. People, the media in the West thinks it's incredibly important if women wear headscarves or not. And they think that wearing a headscarf is the worst thing that could happen to a woman and a sign of total oppression. I and mean, you should see the way this is spoken about. And I feel very privileged to have traveled throughout the Middle East and talked to many passionate feminists, educated, ambitious, intellectual women who choose to wear headscarves for many, many, many fabulous reasons that have nothing to do with what the West is sure a headscarf represents. To the point that I keep trying to explain to the West, you can't tell a thing about a woman's sense of gender politics by whether or not she's wearing a scarf. Um, they won't listen to me, but what I did is on Facebook, which, where I have this global community, it's a democracy building uh, project I started uh, with friends called, well, colleagues called dailyclout.com. I asked women to speak to me about wearing hijab. Tell me why and tell me why not. I, in 20 minutes, got 500 answers from around the world, about 250 about wearing hijab, 250 about not wearing hijab. Every single one of those answers was a feminist answer. There wasn't a single answer I would not describe as feminist. In other words, the way women describe the choice to wear a hijab was narrated in terms of personal discovery, personal boundary setting, personal self-respect, autonomy, uh, a journey in relationship to God. It was category, you know, not my dad made me do it, my brother made me do it. I'm not making a sweeping generalization about women's lives. I know every woman's life is unique and there's, you can find horrible things anywhere. I'm saying that there was this huge, rich discussion that should have been happening globally with everyone listening that completely recontextualized what this symbol meant in a way that would challenge the way France and England and America are encouraging Westerners to fetishize this symbol as an example of a whole religion's oppression of women. Is, is that clear? That it's being distorted um, for political purposes and that women, what should be happening, I don't want to say what wearing a hijab means or doesn't mean, how do I know? But what isn't happening is a global stage where women themselves can share these interpretations and have this debate and have it inform the rest of the world. And round of applause, feel free. And, and part of the reason I bring that up as such an important example is that when you travel in the Muslim world and talk to I powerful feminist leaders, the scarf is the least of their worries. They're, it's not central to what they're talking about. Other issues are much more central. Um, so to wrap this up, um, I guess I just want to say I can't wait to live in the world that these leaders around the world, you guys, um, are creating. I can't wait to hear more and more of these voices take center stage. I want to do everything I can to change the global dialogue platform so that, you know, it's your voices and these voices of women around the world that are central rather than so often marginalized. Um, and, you know, what is, and also that I think that the solution to saving the planet is going to come from this, from opening up this dialogue and really hearing how to empower women around the world because our planet is in crisis even though our revolution is doing very well as women. And I'm certain that the solutions for an increasingly burdened planet are gonna come from um, this huge potential that's unleashed when women around the world are empowered to lead and empower themselves to lead and uh, when they enter the solution stream um, because they 
they have all the solutions. We just haven't heard them all um, into, into manifestation yet. And so to me, that is the real, I mean, what is beauty? That's beautiful. Um, all these voices, all these women, all these leaders stepping into the spotlight and taking charge, 53% charge of their planet, um, which will um, solve everything. So thank you very, very, very much. Thank you. I, I, what I'm hearing is that almost, tw almost two decades after the uh, beauty myth, we are still, uh, uh, it still has a stranglehold on us because the ideal, the iconic figure of a woman is still Miss Barbie. I think you're hearing, uh, can you hear me, is this on? Yes, that's, cor that's correct, that's pretty much what I'm saying. We need to come back to this uh, uh, again to look for I hope a well, I hope you go have to you will be able to offer a strategy to overcome this because this is the continuously repeated uh, message that we are getting. Certainly, mm. yeah. Is that the question, or you just? Uh, no, we'll okay. come back to. I think right. we will we will offer the floor the op the first opportunity to ask questions. Uh, the microphones, yes. The microphones are, where are the microphones? You know, I can wander around and hand people the mic, is yeah. that? Yeah. No, 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 please, no, 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 okay, no, no. No, no. okay, no, okay, <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay. I, I see now the gentleman with the microphones are on both sides. Please uh, uh, put up your hand and allow me to invite you to speak because there will be many people voices. And uh, it would be nice if you could identify yourself yeah. before uh, you uh, speak. My name is Uma you. and uh, I enjoyed your talk very much. Thank um, you. I just want to make a comment about what you said about uh, the developments in the in the developing world in terms Please. of feminism. Uh, but can I ask your comment on the observation that many of us have that, especially in Asia, where a lot of the, um, I would, um, perhaps crime is a big word, but um, I, I'm going to use it anyway, the crime against women are actually committed by other women. And I'll give you examples Please. like in uh, genital mutilation in, in Africa, um, honor, honor killing in, uh, in South Asia, and similarly the way the women are treated by other women. Mm -hmm. So how would you address that, uh, especially a problem in Asia, I think more than the West? So my personal yeah. take is that you perhaps overstated the progress that Asia has made okay. in feminism because well, of this issue. Yeah, yeah, that's an important corrective. I should have been clearer that obviously the um, institutional and, you know, cultural norms like this, these hurdles are, are huge and appalling, of course. Um, I sort of, I should have spelled that out, I assume sort of we all were on the same page about that, you know, already. Um, but that the, f the fight against it is uh, encouraging to me. Um, so you're quite right. I mean, first I really want to stress that my job here is to learn. Um, I mean, I can, you know, I'll, I'll reflect back what you inform me about, but uh, there's such limited coverage in the West of the complexities, you know, of these issues, and, and they're so often caricatured. So I do know the genital mutilation, I didn't know that um, the second issue was... Uh, Honor, honor, honor killing. killings. Yeah. Women kill women in honor well, killings. I think a lot of it is propagated by uh, uh, the, the matriarchal sort of culture in the family that feels that uh, it's not just. Uh, I, I may be overstating it also, but uh, but but I, I just feel that sometimes um, I'm, I'm not I'm not saying that it's not something that's propagated by men. Right. I, I'm fully aware of that, but I'm also aware that there is a significant proportion of it that's propagated by, and that that. Uh, I agree, is um, as much as a problem as... Uh, as so let, let me jump in and speak to what I understand to be women's role in, for instance, genital mutilation. It's not my understanding in the countries that still have it, and, and you know, Egypt, for instance, has over, like, appalling uh, uh, levels of genital mutilation. Um, it's not my understanding that women are in positions to make policy around it or change policy. It's my understanding that they're in positions or you know, often compelled to implement this appalling atrocity. And that often the women who are doing it are impoverished and this is how they survive. And I'm not saying anyone involved in this is making a good decision. I'm just saying it's a lot more complex than, oh, free agents turning on <clears throat> other women to mutilate them. Um, and, where, and this is where I think that um, global 
networks have a very powerful role. I have heard from women who are active in fights against genital mutilation around the world that it, there's this kind of institutional bulwark that militates against change and that they want the international community to you know, shine a light, direct resources, you know, put into place as much pressure as possible to legislate against the practice. Um, and so that's an example of what I'd like to see more of, which is women on the ground uh, defining the policy, how they want to address it, what they want to do, and then you know, the international community kind of backing them up. Um, because those things are so entrenched that it's very, very difficult for activists to make lasting change because they're cultural, you know, and, and presented as religious issues rather than as, you know, workplace issues, for example, that are easier to make policy around. Does that make sense, what I just said? Does, that, does anyone else think that? Am I missing something important that may you want me to know about this? May I, uh, yeah. may I add yes. that a lot of times these women are, are, are acting uh, in accordance to the, their task of having to perpetuate a culture and a tradition. So, Can you exp say, explain are, more about what you mean by that? So they, we are pressured by the tradition right, and right, the culture right, right. To, carry out, to carry out certain types of... Right. Uh, because we are raised to believe right. in that culture, that's the norm, and women have been given that task of, of protecting that very culture that is detrimental right. to themselves. So right. unless they have been empowered to see that there is another way to approach their lives, and unless they are supported by enough of, uh, of voices around them, yeah. then they have really not no very choice. much choice. That's yeah. really true. <laughs> That's really true. Thank you. Shall yeah. we have a, a, a second question, please? Yes, the lady in red. I, I want to say one more thing about that, which is I r my most recent book is called Vagina, and I have a, s thank you, <laughs> I love Singapore. Um, <laughs> I have a whole chapter on um, sexual trauma from genital mutilation and rape. And it turns out that, um, I, I find this fascinating, the neuroscience shows that there's a brain-vagina connection, a brain-clitoris connection, obviously, but that it has to do with women's confidence. In other words, that the dis when women are supported by their culture, in identifying their own sexual desire and knowing how to have sexual pleasure, it boosts neurotransmitters in the brain that create feelings of confidence, focus, ambition, drive, assertiveness, right? Feminist states of mind. And so when I saw this science, I realized, of course, genital mutilation exists. Of course there's rape in war, because it's not about some, it's not about the vagina, it's about the brain. And that when you traumatize women by excising them, you're also making that feedback loop impossible to you know, create these feisty, aggressive, assertive women. Um, and that that's why there's been this taboo against women knowing about their sexuality you know, in every culture. Uh, so I guess one thing I wanna say about how we support women to do what you just described is everywhere we need to talk about rape and genital mutilation in terms of atrocities rather than cultural practices. Yes, um, the lady has been waiting, so... Thanks, Naomi. My name's Tracy, and I'm from Australia. I'm interested in your view about the label of feminist um, and how important you think women leaders... It, uh, it, how important it is for them to take on that label as feminist. And, and the reason I ask that question is, in Australia, we have one female cabinet minister who just in the last couple of weeks has said, no, she doesn't label herself as a feminist. So I'm wondering about the label versus the behaviour. Yeah, I guess I, I would say I'm really not that concerned about the label. It's handy for any movement to have a name. And it's also handy because then you can know your history but I'd rather have a world in which everyone acted like feminists and didn't call themselves, use the F word. <laughs> um, it, yeah, it doesn't concern me that much. I see, I mean, I just kind of turned in my card as a Jew publicly a few, you know, a month or two ago because I know that sounds ridiculous. Um, but I, I, I basically was so uncomfortable with what Israel had done in Gaza that I just didn't want to be aligned with that anymore. And I wanted publicly to say, I, I'm done with this. You know, I'm something else now. Not that I'm not culturally Jewish or religiously Jewish, I am, but that that relationship, I wanted, it was, it was burdening my ethnic identity. 
So by the same token, I'm not that comfortable with the way a lot of Western feminism defines feminism. So I could see, I'm not gonna get rid of the word, but I could see if other people are really uncomfortable with it and wanna create other words, I don't have a problem with that. I think people cr you know, should create words all the time. Look at queer history, you know, the many names people have used to identify themselves as gay or lesbian. Um, it doesn't matter to me that there are many names. What matters is that people keep fighting. Yeah. But may I be prov provocative yes. here? And um, what, if you deny the word, if you deny the name, aren't you denying the, whole, the, the work that has gone before it and the, the meaning of that word? Look, I don't think it's helpful to deny the word feminism, but I do think that women tend to be puritanical and judgmental uh, in their political lives. And I'm not saying you. <laughs> and that one thing we tend to do is police how other women engage in feminist politics. And I'm much more interested in creating a movement in which everyone who cares about women feels like she's free to innovate her own journey and even create her own language. It's handy to have a word that means feminism. It's handy to have a word that means gay. You know, but if that becomes reified, it's not helpful. I mean, here's what I would like. I would like for feminists to be like me. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> totally kidding. What I mean is, I would, if, fem if everyone used the word feminism the way I just spent the last hour defining it, I would have no problem because there would be you know, conservative feminists, radical feminists, orthodox feminists, military feminists, vegan feminists, hamburger-loving feminists. You know, it would be an in inclusive, modifiable term, but the trouble is that in America, at least, it, when some, you say feminist, it's a list of, I have to be pro-choice, I have to be left of center, I have to be this, I have to be that, and that's not helpful. But isn't it that at, at the bottom of it all, if you took away all the different layers of the, di the differences, isn't it isn't feminism simply about protecting the individual's rights? Yes, the it, right it is. That, that for women to be regarded as an individual as much as a man is regarded as an individual. Yes, that's my definition. Right. Right. But I get in a lot of trouble with feminists for making that case. Oh, okay. <laughs> yes, please. Thank you. Uh, there's a mic coming. Thank you. I've been trying very hard <laughs> right from the beginning. Okay, I loved your talk. It Thank was you. wonderful. I read Thank your you. first book with great excitement in 91. Um, I had two or three points that I quickly wanted to sneak in. One, I personally feel that unless women have more political power, you know, there are definitely still going to be that second sex Absolutely. or whatever you want to call them. Absolutely. Political power is extremely important. I come from the land of Indira Gandhi. I'm an Indian. So we actually had a very powerful woman prime minister, but that doesn't mean that most Indian women have political power or equality right. or anything like that. Yeah. The second point I'd like to raise, because I have actually been in academia most of my life, is that in the West, it is commonly believed that the school systems, the education systems, were often pushing girls in a certain direction beyond, you know, beyond teenage. Don't go for science, don't go for computer science, don't go for this, go more for the humanities. Uh, hopefully those barriers are breaking down now, but I think that does happen in many other countries too. Yes. And that, of course, makes a difference to what the woman is going to do. It's true. In the interest of maybe many other questions, is it, were those the points you wanted to make? Uh, yeah, well, I don't know if you can publicly comment on it because um, there is this book by Sheryl Sandberg, which is being talked about a lot. And a lot of people think of her as a feminist. Would you? I mean, I don't know if you'd make a comment. Not for me. Sure. No, I look, I comment on everything publicly. That's oh, great. why I get in trouble all the time. But um, It upsets uh, me a so little bit. Yeah, yeah. If that's your question, sure. I just met Sheryl Sandberg. Uh, two weeks ago, we had a meeting in the face Facebook campus, and um, sure, she's a feminist. I'm like, I'm so much less concerned about who calls himself a feminist. I, I guess what you're hearing is I hate purity campaigns in any shape. You know, I hate policing. Um, I hate identity politics in a way. You know, I think we all need to see our common humanity and relax. But yes, t so is she my kind of, like, are there differences in how we see feminism? Probably, 
I think she underanalyzes institutional discrimination and gives too much credence to the individual. Do I think she's a valuable voice in the conversation? Sure, because here's another thing that happens to women. Women are raised to have a psychology of scarcity so that if one woman gets the spotlight, we all go, oh no, she's gonna speak for all of us. And then, you know, we have to stop her. <laughs> Whereas if we think about abundance and creating multiplicity of opportunities, then we focus on creating a world in which everyone can have their say and we're not so threatened when someone shows up who doesn't do it exactly the way we do it. I'm glad she exists, I'm glad I exist, I'm glad you exist, it's all good. <laughs> Hello Ms. Wolf, how hi. are you? Good, you can call me Naomi. Oh, hi Naomi, <laughs> hi. Uh, I'm Debbie. Um, the quick question is selfies, yes. empowering or not? <laughs> what do you think? Uh, yeah, I kind of think it's empowering, but... Go ahead. Yeah, uh, in Tell another me. way, it's a lot of selfies that you see, or that I see, unfortunately, are just um, pandering to this... Pandering, they sh they're like this ideal, they're the Barbie, you know, the ones that get shared on Facebook are the, one, are the girls with the big boobs and the little you know, the little ways, and they look like prepubescent boys with boobs, basically. <laughs> so, I don't know if that's empowering or if it's just, you know, pushing on the Barbie ideal. Mm -hmm. So, what do you think? I mean, uh, see, this is one of those moments where I'm really more interested in what you think because you're of that generation, where this is the world around you, right? So, this is, the, this is one of these feminist issues you'll, you guys will have to kind of mm. write the books about. Um, but because I'm here on stage and I owe it to you to answer. <laughs> um, you know, of course I would say both, right? And, and that that's why I, it's always like the thing isn't the thing. The thing is the set of relationships around the thing, right? So having a camera and taking your own picture could mean I love myself so much, I'm gonna show the world that I'm fabulous no matter what, or it could mean I'm stuck in a prison in which I'm showing the world that I've lost five pounds and that's the only way I feel good about myself. It's not the technology that determines that, it's your, the psychology around it. So I'm more, what, what interests me is, um, you know, how do we make sure that those young women who are doing that mm. uh, are doing it mostly out of an abundance of self-regard that's positive and healthy, yeah. Um, uh, in a weird way though, I kind of feel like owning the means of production is more empowering than not. That the fact that social media exists means that everyone can make their own magazine. And on balance, I, I do think that's better. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Can, Thank you. Can we give the people at the back a, a chance first? Yes, the lady in white. We'll come back to this side. Hi. Hi, I'm Joanne. Hi, Hello. Joanna. Um, um, I have a question. So, I mean, you've heard of the term tiger mom, yes. right? Yes. And I feel like it almost sounds like the 1950s perfect housewife worrying about, rather than the floor, it's the perfect child. Right. So do you think this is like a backlash of over-educated women just sort of feeling frustrated? Or do you think, I mean, I'm, I'm a mother of three kids, so I'm yes. part of this whole movement, right? And for me, I find it- The tiger it's, mom movement? The, the tiger, but you know, part of it as in, you know what I mean? I'm, I'm, I'm part of it because I have three kids and you can't escape it nowadays, right? And um, I wonder if it's actually changed the way mothers raise their kids and it's maybe a little bit negative and actually the, people think of mothers now in a more sort of aggressive way. Yeah, you're really onto something, and I wish you would write that book. <laughs> you know? um, yes, bad, yes, the answer is yes. Look, with feminism, the version that I described there, which is all about choice and success and rising up the corporate ladder and individu individualism, a very sick model of parenting has emerged in privileged societies, I'm gonna say in the West, but obviously here in Singapore as well from what you're describing. And I'm sure in, you know, uh, metropolises that are affluent, have an affluent sector around the world. Um, I see this in New York, you know, it's the bubble that I fight against myself. Uh, parents in, you know, 
this generation that you're describing are who are affluent. I mean, it's a class thing. I'm not saying I'm not singling you out. I'm just saying it tends to be a demographic thing. Are it's all about turning your child into some kind of like <clears throat> representation of this whole checklist of accomplishments, and that is a change from the way mothers used to be described, even in the most retro way. And in my view, it's a terrible change. And I see more messed up kids in these affluent communities who are raised this way, and I would say more messed up, I mean, it's not about you, I'm glad you raised it, more messed up women, because it does seem like, remember I said the ideal constantly mutates? And so, yeah, you know, the 50s housewife and then the, you know, perfect model of the 90s and aughts and now, you know, these women have grown up and a lot of them have left the workforce to raise kids and they're encouraged to perfectionalize and commodify their home relationships, their family relationships and create a new internalization of an impossible ideal. And what I want to keep throwing out is that this notion that women have to constantly pursue this impossible ideal is a sick, sick, dysfunctional imposition from the culture and we need to reject it. And that it, it does violence to some of the most precious things about being a woman like having an instinctive trust in how you raise your children and you know that loving them is the most important thing you can do for them. Thank you. You know what I'm hearing from these questions while you figure out who gets the mic? What, what is becoming super clear is that peer pressure, you know, is, is big for women and, and the perpetuation of oppressions, whether it's being scared to be the first person on your block to, you know, not excise your daughter to being the first person on your block to not do Kumon or whatever it's called, you know, the, you know, special intensive prep. And that I think that we need to, when we talk about feminism and the success of feminism, I really want to throw out that we need to be willing to be weird, you know, like really weird, like not fit in. <laughs> but someone has the mic now. Yes. yes, hi please. Naomi, uh, hi. my name is Amy, I'm from New York. Hi. And my question is, as more and more women are choosing not to have children, we see this great divide in the conversation between those that do and those that don't and their shared experiences. How can we bridge that gap? And I think there's also a resentment toward women that are choosing not to in the workplace. Yeah. So how do we overcome that? Thank you, so this is a great, <clears throat> they're all great questions, but this is a great question because to me it's an example of a fake issue I mean, not that you're not describing something that's real, but it's real in the media, in my experience. <clears throat> and it's real in the workplace because, but for a fake reason. So I'm not, I'm not challenging your question. What I'm saying is the reason this is portrayed as a big, huge issue is that North America doesn't want to have a work family policy. Um, in countries like Holland that do have work family policies, you don't hear this discourse of, oh my God, you're staying home. Oh my God, you're going to work. Because it really doesn't matter. The state is taking care of the needs of women who work and women who stay home. <clears throat> so that's, I guess what, I, what I'm encouraging in, in North America is for us to be more critical about media narratives because they often cover a political agenda which is chambers of commerce just don't want to spend the money to give women the kinds of choices they have in countries with a social welfare net. Is there anyone upstairs? Yes. Yes, please. Uh, it is on. Uh, my name is Michael Swido. Um, Naomi, thank you so much for your presentation. Thank it's you. It's incredibly insightful. Thank you. And despite what you may say about the word feminist, I would proudly say that I am one. Awesome. That's wonderful. You've You're going to make a lot of friends here tonight. <laughs> <coughs> You've had the opportunity uh, in what you do to meet some amazing women, I'm sure. And I'm curious, outside of the West, who would be your feminist heroes? If oh, you could give us an that's example. That's a great question. Um, well, a, a number come to mind, but I always think about Reem Ali, who's a Jordanian. She's the sister-in-law of the king, and she's in Amman, and she started a journalism school in a region that obviously does not have a rich ancient tradition of freedom of speech. Um, so she's one of my heroes. Uh, there's, I mean, I, I hate to kind of single out individual woman, women. There's this, there are sort of women around, around the world who are less well known. Um, 
there's a woman who's the subject of a documentary, also Jordanian, uh, and it's about low-income women being trained to be solar engineers. Um, and uh, I guess women who are fighting, you know, genital mutilation in West Africa, and again, I am not able to name them individually because I've sort of met them in passing, um, but the, the way that they brave, you know, huge social opprobrium to, to engage in that fight is very, very inspiring to me. Um, and I mean, I'm just thinking about when I was last in India, you know, again, it's a lot of women who don't have a kind of national brand name, brand name recognition, a group of young journalists in India who are female journalists who are very concerned about um, the way that women are raped on the street in this particularly horrific way in India. And then I encouraged them to become citizen journalists and document a young Indian woman's perspective about this, and so they send me updates, at which I publish on my Facebook, you know, social media. Those are the kinds of women who um, inspire me. Yeah, and I, I wish that I had all of their names in front of me, and I don't. I'm sorry. Fantastic. I, I heard a clip of you on 938 Live the other day, and I, I know you're going to be on Tuesday evening at uh, seven o'clock. So oh, thank you for telling that. people because I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thanks so thank much. Uh, yeah. Microphone, please, in front. Hi, um, I'm Elizabeth, I'm also from New York. Um, I just wanted to know what is the next step then? You said you're a little bit tired of the trivial conversations about Taylor Swift's new lyrics. So what, or that we've taken detours. Yeah. So what is it, what in your mind would be a good next step for us in the West? Oh God, you, I really have to restrain myself. Um, <laughs> or just a couple or one. <laughs> no, I think we have to shut up and listen. You know, we have a real problem, a real, real problem, which is that we are positioned inside this bubble of narcissism where we don't get to hear anyone in the rest of the world. It's not all our fault. We, you know, our media has been completely sealed off from the rest of the world. You, it's hard to find out what's going on outside of our borders. Um, but there's also a cultural problem, which is even when we have access to, you know, other news, we position ourselves as running everything. I mean, the numbers of times I've seen some crisis and heard Western feminists say, how do we let them know what to do, <laughs> you know? Um, so I think our problem is a psychological problem of not being aware of our relationship to the rest of the world as, as one of equality. Yeah, and that's what we need to fix. Thank you. Thank you very much, Naomi. Thank you. Um, since you've been here, you've been talking to a lot of people, done amazing homework from the comments that you made. But my comment is about second wave feminism and third wave feminism. And I think that second wave feminism needed to happen. Of course. You know, otherwise the third, world, uh, third wave feminism wouldn't have happened. Absolutely right. So it's, it's a maturity of that. And the second wave feminist did some Amazing. Amazing. I mean, that's the, Amazing. that is the revolutionary period of feminism. Totally of right. Feminism. I totally agree with you. <laughs> and, and I think that's also the problem is the American version of the second wave feminism. And they were, there's a continuum of extremism as well as there is uh, very moderate feminists who, who have achieved and I think in Asia, that's what we tend to follow, at least in Singapore, that's right. what we tend to follow. The more moderate version. More exactly. moderate version. And so, although we like to call ourselves feminists, and, uh, and I agree with Dana, that we need to, I think the word feminism has been, or feminists have been demonized mm -hmm. to such an extent that people don't want to associate themselves with that. And also they don't want to, they want, they think of feminists as that extreme brand of feminism. Right, right. So, so that's do you my have a, comment. Uh, is that a question or an observation? It's my comment. It's your comment. About, well, yes. thank you. I mean, I should really stress that while I gave a critique of second wave feminism, tell me your name again. Constance. Constance is absolutely right. Phenomenal revolution, did so many things right. And the nature of a healthy 
you know, movement is when each generation, like, I can't wait for you guys to write your books about how wrong I am. That's a sign of health <laughs> in, in feminism. Um, but I do agree with you. And, and also, you know, they don't get the recognition that they deserve for all the things they did right. It, before we move on to the next questioner, unless we need to wrap it up, because I see some people are leaving, what is Asian feminism? When people use that phrase, what are they talking about? Or is there no way to encapsulate it? Right, right. And I think it has to do with the culture of the particular country, the experiences of the particular country. And in some countries in Asia, like for instance, in India, the problems are great. The poverty of women, great. Mm -hmm. uh, Singapore cannot define what Asian feminism okay, is. Okay, thank you. That's a relief because people mm -hmm. are using that phrase and I'm like, what could that possibly mean given <laughs> how many countries there are? So thank you. I feel less stupid now. The young, <laughs> the gen young men wants to. Uh, there's someone that. very eager over there. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, one thing that really I agree with is what you spoke about in saying that feminism should be more inclusive. So one area for that is definitely perhaps the idea of men. I think especially in Asia, it's difficult for men to fully identify as feminists. Part of it is cultural, but I think what you said about what's happened with feminism in the last 20 years is partly contributing to that. Yes. So. Um, what's your take on this? How, how do you think that men can be more involved in feminism? And perhaps uh, a remark for Dana. Uh, given what she said about feminism having to be more inclusive, would AWARE consider including men as full members? I love that. <laughs> you want to Connie wants to take answer. <laughs> The group of women who took over away in 2009 because we had that as, as part of our constitutional review. We wanted to include men. We were, we were considering it. We were considering it. It's <laughs> <laughs> very interesting. But how can you constitute, how can you legally exclude men? <laughs> Whoa, that was a weird vibe <laughs> in the room. Whoa. I, the, I don't think that the, if you are, you're, uh, if you identify as a feminist, which is that you identify as uh, you, which is that you believe in equality for it in the in the rights of the individual, uh, that I think that is more important a commitment than to point finger at one organisation which is set up specifically for the objective of correcting the imbalance that I, exists in society. I did that. He didn't do that. He, I'm, yeah. the, I'm, I'm the one who did that. He didn't do that. No, no, I, no. I, no, <laughs> but, no, but sorry, sorry. I, I, I'm saying the, th that question of whether... Because uh, where has often been taken to task for not admitting m male members in the, in the leadership especially. We were... Uh, for some time now, we have been cons we do have male membership as associate members, so they don't have full membership rights. So this has been taken against us. But th this is an organization set up by women to correct the imbalance that exists in society. So until that problem is resolved or more resolved, I think, I think it, is, it is too early for us to, to, to think of involving men because you know, you have a. <laughs> you can join in the conversations, right? You are invited to the roundtable discussions. You are invited to the, to the events, and what we need is an evolution, right? It's time I, for evolution. So I, I guess I respectfully, very, very much disagree with what you just said. <laughs> and I, I respectfully disagree <laughs> with what you say. Right? You see, the problem is we have a situation where what we need is to have the space for women to be able to come together to articulate their problems. So I don't think it's an either or. I don't see why it's yeah. an either or. I th I, you know, look, I don't live here and you're doing very important work and I respect your leadership. That said, uh, I don't, I think we're in a turning point. I don't want to be part of any organization anywhere, including I mean, this, you know, I was just having this discussion about, like, is it apartheid in Israel? I don't think there's any room for any organization anywhere that leaves people out on the basis of their gender or their race or their religion or anything. <laughs> and, and just so you don't think, because I, I, I understand the arguments of women need space of their own and men will take it over. And my view is, 
A, if we're so passive that allowing men or including men means that they're going to take it over, we need to work on ourselves. And B, we do. Okay. And that's why we have an organization that allows us to work on ourselves. But I mean, we shouldn't like keep him out if he wants to be a feminist in Singapore. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so all I was saying is... It doesn't have to be an aware member to be a feminist. No, but how do you, ju like, again, let me circle back to this because it freaked people out and I always like to go there. Um, how can you legally exclude someone on the basis of their gender from an organization? There's no gender equality in Singapore? Really? There's no law that says... How right. Okay. Is okay, it legal? Like if he showed up and said, I want to come that in and that join, he's what would That we are against his constitutional right, he could probably... Okay. Yes, he can make up an he argument for that. He just isn't going to make that. a lot of friends. Right. This is so can, sad. Okay. okay. Can, I, can, can we... Uh, the gentleman, it was a man who just told me we have five minutes or time's up. Can we just take one last question? Well, I feel like let's, let's just like heal this breach, okay? Because you've been... <laughs> You've been kind enough to include me. I, I just wanted to say positively, and you know you're the expert on your organization, I don't see any reason you couldn't have events that are women only, spaces, discussions, because sometimes women do need to talk about things without men being around, and also ways of including. And let me give you an example. I was just on the Barnard campus, and on Columbia, this was covered in the Straits Times, there's this protest where this woman's carrying around a mattress because she was assaulted. So now the whole university is showing support and all these men are carrying around mattresses to show support and this makes me cry. You know, to see, I was there seeing all these young men dragging around these mattresses all by themselves as a way to participate and be feminists and show support. And it was absolutely organic, coherent, humane, healing, as a survivor of sexual violence myself, I found it healing to see these men carrying this stuff around and, and showing, you know, finding a role. And so I'm just saying, when we give our creative energies to it, there are so many ways to open the doors to embrace and include men as feminists. No and doubt, no doubt yeah. about it at all. But Miss Wolf, we are the Association of Women for Action and Research. And we work in collaboration with men and other organizations all the time. But we are an association of women for action and research. So unless we change our constitution, change our names, uh, and the time might come for that, but the time is arguably not now. Okay. <laughs> I agree with you.